a modern woman, Miss Campbell. I don't quite know what you mean, ma'am. Do you wish to be the equal of men so that you could vote or smoke cigars? If I were allowed the vote, I would vote for a law prohibiting the smoking of cigars. Oh, yes, that would be wonderful. Though I doubt it will ever happen. No, I suppose not. Women have no need to seek equality. They are already superior. My God. Children, children, come, 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 quick. Good morning, gentlemen. Please put your hands in the air. What is the meaning of this? You're a prisoner of the German Navy and the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Helmsman, hold your cause. If you want to live, do exactly as I tell you. Drop your weapons or I'll shoot you. Thank you very much for coming by today to chat a little bit about uh, your work and your life so far. My pleasure, Steve. Thank you for asking. You are a very highly regarded director. You produce, you write, and you're a sometimes actor. From and I've just written my first novel. Really? Now, whether anyone will want to publish it is another matter. But uh, I sent it to the publishing agent of an author friend of mine who said, yeah, send me the first three chapters. So that's what they all do. So I sent the first three chapters and uh, eventually got a reply saying, send the rest. So I live in hope, should we say. That's encouraging. Yeah. But a, a novel allows you to embroider and express the thoughts of the characters yes. much more easily than uh, in the sort of the movie formula. Hey, did you find it hard work? to do that, to sit by yourself and work on that? Well, yes, but it, uh, writing screenplays is hard too. Yes. I mean, you have to stare at the empty page and you have to write things you don't like and erase them. And it, it takes me about an hour and a half to two hours to really get into it mm -hmm. and to you know, uh, obliterate the, the distractions. Uh, and uh, then I might have four, four good hours of getting stuff down. Okay. And then the next day I'll revise what I did as part of a way of getting into it. But it's the same, the same focus uh, and, uh, as it is for writing a screenplay. But uh, you know, as your, your choice of words in, in a screenplay has to be very uh, well measured, I do screeds of words in a novel and then hack back. Sure. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, it, it was fun, and uh, I think I have a, a gift for ironic prose, shall we say that. Well, uh, it's how you expressed yourself in real life, so I'm not surprised that uh, you, you have a, a bit of a... I am a long streak of irony. Yes, yes. Uh, and a little bit of sarcasm. You mm -hmm. don't suffer fools graciously. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> no, that is true. That's been my experience with that, you. That's true. No, no, it's... Uh, now, you, you've written quite a bit. As a, as a, for a director, uh, do you enjoy the process of writing? Is that fun for you or is it hard work or a combination? Well, it's a combination. I mean, I am a director who writes rather than a writer-director. Mm -hmm. uh, and occasionally I have conceived vehicles that I have uh, then written and directed. And in other cases, I have come in and done a rewrite or I've collaborated uh, with a writer um, or been, you know, uh, there are many permutations, but uh, I've also done quite a lot of uh, script doctoring for people. And yes. most, most of the writing I, I do these days is from a director's standpoint to make a, a scene more credible, uh, to sort out logic problems, uh, or, or doing a production rewrite. Of, we, we can't afford the chariot race. It's got to be a bicycle race. Uh, <laughs> uh, we shoot tomorrow, make the adjustment. Right. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I do. Uh, so that, that I find um, quite uh, entertaining. Uh, but as for you know, as for writing, I mean, writing is initially structure, uh, yes. and I learned a lot about structure um, making movie trailers, um, which also have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and uh, be a sales message in two minutes. Uh, and you know, that was 
educational to me in, in, you know, when I went on to actually make my own films. And I continued making trailers for a good you know, 15, nearly 20 years after I first directed. Was that how you got your start in well, business? In a, or in a way. I mean, um, I had a forged reference from a British film company that said I'd worked for them as a, as a clapper boy, and I think I was the worst clapper boy they ever um, employed. So they, uh, But I was entertaining, so they, they did use me from time to time. I, my, my very first day was on a, a production concerning the British uh, cop show Z Cars, and I read the entire slate. Uh, um, uh, till I was told to stop. Um, but, um, uh, but anyway, when I was announced I was going to visit the land of my father in Australia, they, uh, I said, you know, would you mind if I wrote a reference and would you sign it? Uh, and they said, no, not at all. So I produced the reference that I'd already written on their letterhead and uh, they were amused by the effrontery and signed it. So I took it with me to Australia and that got me my first job at Channel 10 in Sydney as a news cutter. And that's where I really started to learn editing and editing is, is the grammar and syntax of, of film. And that led to me, you know, in my humble way, saying to this, the you know, program manager that I thought the station promos were lousy and I could do better. And uh, in those days in Australia, uh, if you said you could do something, they would give you a shot. Uh, so I started making the station promos, which led to the rival network stealing me um, and made you know, promos for them at twice the salary, which is nice. Um, and then I took a reel of my promos with me around the world to uh, America and England uh, to go back and visit my parents in England and uh, an American company I stopped in on uh, in, in, my, uh, in the US looked at them and said, hmm, we have an opening in London for the junior of four writer-producers of trailers, why don't you go see them? So I was duly hired in England and for two years made trailers for Hammer Horrors mm. for uh, that film that is uh, the beautiful poster behind you, in Once Upon a Time in the West, I made a trailer for that. My goodness. Um, yeah, that's six degrees of separation, isn't it? That's the way things work, though. Yeah, it is, it is. And uh, eventually the Australians said, please come back and make and run the whole network's promos. Hmm. Uh, and uh, I said, well, only if you let me make programs. And that was how I got in, uh, which was very lucky. Instead of having to work my way up through the crew or something, I sort of slipped sideways into the, uh, the, the, the top echelon and basically I had to teach myself how to do it, of course. Now to back up a little bit, um, were you born in Australia? No, I was born in England, okay. in, in Maidenhead. Okay. Uh, and uh, my father was Australian. The Trenchard Smiths had uh, been in Australia since the 1850s, made their money in the gold rush, lost it all in real estate, which is no mean feat. Uh, and uh, um, most of my relatives were uh, it, somehow in the media by the the 30s or 40s. In, uh, in Australia? Mm. Yeah, my cousin Teddy uh, ran the Sun Pictorial. He was the general manager of the Sun Pictorial in Melbourne. Okay. But my father always wanted to fly, and he particularly wanted to escape working for his father um, as an accountant. Uh, and so he took a short service commission offer in England and joined the Royal Air Force. And because he was such a good pilot, he was back at flying school as an instructor nine months after he left it, and they gave him a full commission, which was why you know, he was then available to, uh, you know, to fight in the Battle of Britain and get shot down over France and dig, dug tunnels for the Great Escape, which, uh, and then so back to... He was a hero in his he was a, he was a hero, never liked to talk about the war. Never wanted, never went to a reunion. Yeah, you know, it was a terrible experience. You know, four mm. years of being cold, and hungry, and yes. yeah, and threatened uh, in, in a prisoner of war camp. Uh, it gives one perspective, doesn't it, as to when you're worried about yes. whether people are upset with your movies or something. Yes, yes, yeah. you you could be standing on a parade ground uh, for three hours being counted. Yes, um, and uh, and on the edge of death. Well, yes, he, he, he nearly got killed when he fell between the wires in uh, Warburg. They moved them to a Polish, uh, you know, a prison camp in Poland, uh, and he was one of the 12 people that fused the camp um, generator with a razor blade uh, on a moonless night, put a 
makeshift ladder up one wire, plank across the middle, jumped off the end. He fell off between the wires. Oh, Germans wow. let off thousands of rounds of ammunition, only shooting one of their own in the leg. But my father ended up, you know, he could feel the ground occasionally being hit by bullets nearby. And he thought, mm, well, this might be it. But it wasn't. Um, and he spent 30 days in the cooler uh, with bread and water. So, I mean, I, I have a heroic father to live up to, and I don't really think that I have entirely done that. But the, the, the show ain't over till the fat lady sings. So. What you have done with your life and uh, what you've done with your work is heroic in, in its own way. Everyone has an opportunity to be a hero within their lives. And thank, mm. thank God you didn't have to fight too many wars or no. do that except in the movies. Yes, yes. It's a better I, way to fight. I've, I've made a number of war films. Uh, yes. But, uh, you know, it's, he had a sense of determination, which, uh, and so did my mother. Um, she was an actress before they married. So uh, my interest in film, which sprang up early in life, uh, was encouraged by my parents. Now, not everyone has that advantage. Uh, most people, you know, don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Uh, most parents say, well, come on, that's very interesting, uh, but really be, do something sensible, be an accountant. Find or, a real job. Yeah, find a real job. So, um, but they said, no, if you want to do it, uh, give it a shot. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I made eight millimeter films while I was at school. I was, you know, became the, the head of the school film society and uh, um, got, to, got to visit Pinewood and Shepperton, got to see Sean Connery do a pickup for Dr. No. Mm. Um, there in the middle of this deserted soundstage was a small pile of sand which was representing the sand on which he had curled up to go to sleep in uh, Jamaica in Dr. No. And they wanted a shot of him going to sleep on his gun. They never used the, uh, the shot in the film, but afterwards, you know, during editing, they thought they needed it. So I watched that from a distance. Uh, but uh, and then went round the big empty set of Dr. No's nuclear reactor and thought, oh, I want to do this. Yes. Uh, um, so you were, in about what, how old were you? I was at that 16 point? when that happened, but I'd already made up my mind at 13 uh, that I wanted to make films. I had okay. a sort of epiphany moment. You know, my parents were allowing me to go to the movies by myself, uh, and I could walk through the English village to the, the Regal Theatre, Odium in Hampshire, and there was a double bill of Vertigo uh, and a, a Rory Calhoun B-movie western, Four Guns to the Border. Uh, curious pairing. Yes. Uh, but Vertigo never it did, never did well. I think it's one of Hitchcock's greatest. Uh, yes. But it never did well. He was ahead of his audience at that time. It, it mesmerized me. I was not at 13 really fully in tune with all the dark undercurrents that he was exploring. Yes. But I thought, this, <clears throat> this is incredible. And then it occurred to me, just as uh, I, I was leaving, people get paid to make these things and you know when I'm 18 I'm gonna be leaving school and I'm gonna have to do what adults do which is work for a living uh, and people work for a living making films fine that's what I'll do easy well of course it isn't easy but yes. I think I've been very lucky to be in the right place at the right time well you have uh, you know worked a great deal which uh, many directors never do and you know you've made uh, or have credits on you know, 50, 60 different pictures. And, <coughs> yeah, well, and, between them all, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, that's rather extraordinary because it's not uncommon to have a very first-rate director that ends up making 10 or 15 pictures mm -hmm. in their whole life. That's their whole career. Yeah, and they're probably a little more choosy about their, their work than I have been. I've never seen a, 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 a greenlit picture I didn't like. Um, put it that way. Though there are some that I have turned down and that was possibly silly of me. I have made some films that are certainly considered by some to be uh, morally reprehensible. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, Turkey Shoot, for instance, uh, uh, you know, or Escape 2000 as it is known here, which is a high camp splatter movie. Oh, it caused outrage in Australia when I, you know, when, when, when that was first shown. Um, I mean, perhaps it should not have been shown to the Australian Film Institute uh, as, as an awards contender. Perhaps that was a mistake by the producer. He, he, but, or maybe he wanted to provoke the howls of outrage that went. Uh, anyway, but, uh, 
But you know, I guess there is a line for all of us beneath which we, yeah, we will not uh, go in our choices. Well, certain things feel right yeah. for you, yeah. and you, you make those kinds of choices. But uh, uh, you know, one of the nice things about the studio system is that back in the old days, directors did work a lot. And, oh yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that's how you hone your craft. That's how you get yeah. better and better. Uh, Absolutely, and and. Uh, I, it is a pity that they don't do that anymore, that directors have never contracted for more than one or two pictures at a time. Yes. I would love to be a house director for somebody. Uh, and, you know, you, we got, we've got a couple of episodes for you to do next week and the, well, the rest of the month. Then we want you to do a telly movie and later in the year there'll be a miniseries. Hey, it works for me. Because it doesn't matter who I work for, it's what I can put into the film uh, and, and gratify my own, you know, creative yeah, search. Well, within the financial um, and conceptual box that you work within, uh, you really have done some rather extraordinary work. I mean, uh, you and I and Paul have worked on about you know six or seven films together, yeah. and they're some of the movies that I'm most proud of, and really well, enjoy thank you. watching yeah. again and again. Um, getting back to uh, the beginning. Um, did you have brothers and sisters? No, I think it's pretty obvious I'm an only child. Uh, but, uh, and that undoubtedly helped me in a single-minded pursuit of my goal. My mother was uh, ebullient and my father was quiet. Okay. Quiet, uh, formal, a man of, con of great empathy, uh, but um, he yeah, he was a quiet man before he went to prison camp, and he was a quieter man when he came back. And mm. uh, he you know, he reached the rank of wing commander, but he could have gone on to air commodore or even air vice marshal if he had played the game. And uh, he he just you know he was too much of a truth teller, I think. Um, and so he yeah he was stalled at wing commander, and he you know, retired after his twenty five years. But he yep. he inculcated into me. You know, a certain sense of responsibility and stick with itness. Yep. Uh, but uh, uh, and you know, he he enjoyed watching the growth of my career. And uh, you know, sadly, he died just before a film that I made. Really, uh, with him and the World War II generation as my inspiration, I uh, did a remake of the uh, Humphrey Bogart movie. Uh, 1943 movie uh, directed by Zoltan Korda um, uh, called Sahara. There have been many films, of course, of that title. I didn't want to ruin it. Uh, and um, they had 24 days to make it in, and I had 18. Uh, I think they, yeah, they had 25 days to make that film in. Uh, I had 18, and uh, I think it came out really quite well. You either you like it or you don't, depending on whether you accept Jim Belushi in the uh, Humphrey Bogart role. He understood what the part called for. So I think we, we captured the, the spirit and the, the nobility of the World War II generation. But you know, unfortunately, uh, four days after I finished shooting, my father died. Uh, mm. But I guess you know, up there in that multi-cable system in the sky, uh, uh, he has probably seen it by now. We need to you know, become more selfless people like that generation was. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, they they yeah, you know, they had a lot to offer. Uh, it certainly is true, and um, I I think we've lost a lot of that. Mm. Um, you know, and the secret to it is that if you render yourself of service to others, and you're mm. looking for opportunities mm. to do the right thing, you end up being the happier for it. I, if yeah. you're always thinking about yourself and what mm. I can get for me. Typically, your life's not a happy life. No, because there's never enough. Uh -huh. uh, and you know, I, I try and apply this to uh, the way I work with a crew, um, because I don't believe anybody in any department does their best work in an atmosphere of blame and fear. And frankly, uh, I've seen a lot of film sets, and I'm, you know, I'm aware of a lot of directors who are fairly tyrannical, uh, and producers too. Uh, and there's you know, a sense in the crew that, you know, well, I'll just do what I'm told, I'll never step outside the box, and I'll just cover my ass the whole time. Uh, and that, you know, you don't get the best out of people's creativity uh, if, they, if they feel uh, in danger of blame. So I try and create a happy atmosphere on the set. I, you know, 
I firstly tell people the kind of film I'm trying to make out of this you know, particular script. And, and you know, we're going to do this scene and it's going to be shot from this person's perspective because of these psychological underpinnings to the character or we're going to do a suspense scene and there'll be, we'll be cutting back and forth. You know, the shark is coming, the shark is coming, etc. Um, so I let people into the creative process mm -hmm. so that they don't just feel like tools and uh, you know, as, as impersonal as that light stand, for instance. Uh, uh, I want, want them to feel that they're actually bringing something creative to every you know, uh, every function that they do, um, and you know, it, once once you get that kind of happy atmosphere on the set, uh, it actually speeds the wheels of industry, and so I, that's what that's how I can shoot pictures in 12, 14, 15 days. Right. Uh, um, but obviously, planning has a lot to do with it. But uh, you, the more you communicate. Yeah, it's, it is. We are in the communications business, and right. that should extend also to the way the set functions. Well, you're known as a person that communicates very effectively mm. to your colleagues uh, on the set. That's uh, one thing that people comment on all the time. They can, they know what they're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. It isn't left vague. And you're quite right. That's the way you can organize it, like a almost like a military operation, to make sure it happens. Mm. Um, you also find that you you learn a lot from each of these people that you work with. Everybody has something to teach us. Oh yes, yeah. And now you, uh, you you headed back to Australia and you had made a lot of trailers and cut news and done a bunch of other things. What happened then? How did you segue into actually making movies? Well, um, I started you know running the, the network promos for, okay. for for National Nine Network and. Uh, uh, and I was appointed as part of my deal, special projects producer. So if ever they had anything that just needed to be done um, uh, by a, a creative person, uh, they would you know, come to me. I mean, there were directors they had that directed shows, Bandstand, the musical show. So I was, you know, I would make music videos for Bandstand okay. um, before music videos were music videos. And, I'd take a band out into the streets or the fields or you know, an interesting building and sort of jump cut their their song in various locations and, and cut it together. Um, and you know that's yeah, that's now what they call music videos. So I would do a bit of that, and I, I I always do like you know setting things to music, and so that was that was fun. Um, and uh, then I, you know, obviously I didn't fall flat on my face doing that, so my responsibilities expanded. And then one day they thought they'd throw a real hot potato at me. There was a, uh, a show, they had, they had to do something to thank French television, T what was subsequently TF1, for helping them out on some broadcast that was done in, uh, in France. So. This was a live via satellite, one hour live television special, starting at 8.45 uh, Christmas morning uh, in Australia, beaming to France at quarter to midnight Christmas Eve. So that we were, it was an outside broadcast with three cameras from Manly Beach. Uh, in Sydney, and Father Christmas was to be rowed ashore by the, the manly lifesavers. He was a terrified, petrified man at the front of the boat. Um, <laughs> perhaps no, no one had told him about this. He thought he was going to be sitting under the uh, fake Christmas tree that we planted on the sand. He didn't realize he was being taken out of the ocean and then rowed in through the breakers. And he had to come in and sort of hit the sand pretty much uh, at, uh, at midnight. And the whole thing was in French. And I do speak a modicum of bad schoolboy French. And so the, the, the French sent their producers out. And, and I had to shoot film sequences that could be rolled from the truck whenever we got into trouble uh, live. Um, and uh, it, it was, that was quite an interesting experience. And it worked out well. Uh, I can remember. It sounds difficult. It, it was difficult. I mean, I'd never done, and I have never done since, a live broadcast before. I mean, I had a technical director who would actually press the buttons, cutting from one camera to the other. Sure. and to rolling 
the videotape of the film sequences of how Australia celebrates Christmas. Noël en Australie was the, uh, the title of it. And Jacques Chapard, who was the, I guess, the French equivalent of Alan Wicker in his day. We ever saw the Granada's Alan Wicker. Sure. He was the host and he was roaming around the beach. We had a hundred children, Aboriginal children from an orphanage had to run across the beach and be given presents from the Christmas tree and all sorts of stuff like that. And I do remember the French producer sitting beside me in the, the, the budget rented truck suddenly saying, les raquins, les raquins. And I thought, the sharks, sharks? And I said, cameras, look for sharks, look for sharks. Suddenly cameras were panning this way. <laughs> this is when Father Christmas was coming in on the boat. Oh, good. Um, uh, and, uh, but yeah, we didn't see any sharks, unfortunately. But, um, uh, but anyway, that was one of the little curveballs you suddenly uh, have to quickly interpret in live television. Uh, and uh, so anyway, I handled that, and then they gave me more to do. So I then made my first dramatized documentary called For Valor. Uh, which was about four Australians who won the Victoria Cross in Vietnam, which was a very unpopular war in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was making a film about heroes of an unpopular war. But, uh, you know, I've always had an affection for, for soldiers who do a rotten job and uh, never get enough praise for it and, and appreciation. And yes. certainly we have, we've certainly seen that in the last eight years. Um, but, uh, um, so I made that. I interviewed the two that were still living because the, others, the other two were killed in action. Mm -hmm. I interviewed the Australian Prime Minister who was a World War II you know, uh, RAAF hero. Um, and yeah, that one worked out quite well. And, uh, and then I started to express my interest in making films about Hollywood. So I made two TV specials called The Big Screen Scene part one and part two, which enabled me to have a nice junket going all around the world, interviewing stars, directors, uh, and putting them in this thing. And in that, I decided I would do my first action scene to demonstrate how action scenes are made. And I staged a bank robbery uh, with a little car chase afterwards. And that, in turn, gave birth to my first independent film. Um, after a couple of years, I left Channel 9, formed Trenchard Productions, Proprietary Limited and made a film called The Stuntmen, yes. which, in which four different types of movie sequence are uh, you know, demonstrated and then the tricks of the trade revealed. And this is part of my sort of lifelong fascination with men of danger. Um, you know, having been a sort of a devout coward on the rugby field, I, I overcompensated by making films about people you know, and narrowly escaping death or not escaping it, as the case may be. So I made uh, The Stuntmen, which won a prize at the Sydney Film Festival for Best Documentary. That was a calling card, useful calling card. I went on to make a film. I went, to, to, I went up to Hong Kong and to, with a view to making a film a documentary about Bruce Lee, this new Asian phenomenon who hadn't yet broken in the West. Mm. But I was aware of him because of my interest in Asian cinema. Of course, touching down at Jakarta Airport uh, on my way with you know, the money basically spent, the cameraman on board, big, big newspaper hoarding, Bruce Lee dies. Oh dear. Uh, so I go to Hong Kong. I, I, can't, I can't get anywhere close to the funeral. I buy some footage from a TV station of the funeral. Uh, I interview people that are you know, still prepared to talk about it. And somehow I make something that, uh, that works for a 50 minute special, which I had, had pre sold to the. Uh, Do you have a theory network. as to what happened there? Well, strangely enough, I. When I went back to Hong Kong to make Man from Hong Kong, I stayed in the apartment below the apartment he died in. Mm. Um, and uh, he <coughs> was, uh, it is believed that he had an allergy to equigesic, which was a, um, uh, a muscle cramp reliever. Bruce Lee would train five hours a day. There wasn't an ounce of body fat on him. He was just sinew, muscle, and bone. Mm -hmm. um, and he you know, did get cramps. Uh, so this was a drug, I understand, that helped women's period pains. Uh, so uh, he took that. Uh, he'd taken it once. I'm, again, I'm, I get this from a, a former Golden Harvest uh, executive. He'd taken it once while doing looping for Enter the, Enter the Dragon mm -hmm. uh, in LA and had passed out. And 
really you know, passed out for a few minutes and then recovered and didn't, you know, didn't really connect the two. Um, perhaps people thought it was exhaustion or something like that. He took it again this particular afternoon or late, you know, late afternoon prior to joining Raymond Chow and George Lazenby, former James Bond, to talk about the film they were going to do together. Mm. He didn't show up to dinner because he, you know, uh, yeah, he went into the bedroom uh, to saying he was, you know, had a headache, lay down, and he had a massive cerebral hemorrhage, and that was that. Uh, so that was what I was told, uh, and I'm inclined to believe that more than uh, he angered the martial arts hierarchy by giving away too many secrets, and uh, he... He was you know, struck with the, the fatal palm technique or something. Yeah, that, uh, that seems a little It, it is a little far-fetched, but hey, look what's going to happen with Michael Jackson. Uh, there will be all sorts of far-fetched rumors, um, and uh, like Elvis, he will be cited. Uh, so who it's, knows? That's how people entertain themselves. It, it, indeed. Yes. I mean, there's... Uh, uh, but, you know, I, I prefer my level of unreality, let's say. I understand. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you were not able to get what nope. you wanted there, although you had a little bit of excitement going on while you were there. Yeah. yeah. What did you do then? Well, I made this tribute to him, um, and I had got sequences. I got permission for sequences for, to his films and uh, made you know, the world of kung fu and uh, okay. it honored my pre-sale to... Uh, uh, yeah, it was actually to, to, a rival, to my, a rival network to my own because I wanted to expand my, uh, uh, my client base. Uh, and, but then I made a sequel to it, um, which I gave to my old buddies at Channel 9, uh, Kung Fu Killers, who will inherit the mantle of Bruce Lee. And that's when I took my stuntman friend, Grant Page, to Hong Kong to find out who was the new martial arts guy uh, who would be the new top star of Asia. Uh, strangely enough, we, we asked, well, who is it going to be? And there are this list of names. Oh, well, they think this guy's good, and they think that guy's good, and there's this Jackie Chan guy, but his first movie's just flopped, and I, I don't think he's going to go anywhere. Yeah, right. Well, they, didn't, they didn't have it right, did they? They did not have it right. Um, but um, anyway, that gave me a relationship with Raymond Chow of uh, Golden Harvest. Yes. And so I had, you know, had written a story for Bruce Lee, which was in my back pocket when I went up there to make the tribute to him. I had written it under the title Yellow Peril. It was an ironic title, um, it, you know, about you know, a, a Chinese cop who comes to Australia on a routine extradition and uh, just about wrecks the place right. uh, in the name of justice, of course. Property damage and loss of life is perfectly excusable uh, if you do it in the name of justice. Um, uh, and of course, yeah, I was going to use the interview with Bruce as an opportunity to present it. Well, that didn't work out. So I gave it to Raymond Chow later, and he said, no, well, you know, if you can get the Australians to come up with half the money, um, then we might come up with half the money. Okay. So I went back to friends I had developed at uh, the Greater Union Organization, the largest distribution and exhibition combine in Australia, and said, I have an offer from Raymond Chow in Hong Kong for half the money for this. Um, will you match it? Uh, and they said, right, okay, well, if that's the case, then we will match it. So you I became a producer. Yeah, I became a producer. <laughs> and it was not just, it wasn't sort of lying or fraud. It was just a sort of rearrangement of the order of the facts, sure. really. Uh, uh, and, it's, it's a time-honored tradition. It, absolutely. Uh, the fact is both sides wanted to get into bed with each other, right. and I was very happy, to coin a phrase, to be the meat in the sandwich. Uh, but uh, uh, so, you know, that worked out. Uh, and um, no, Nothing gets done if you tell the truth all the time. It just not all the time. Well, it, it's selective truth-telling, shall we say. But, and luckily, both sides had the money. Um, and, yeah, but anyway, so, so I, I, that, that worked out reasonably well, but it was not the kind of film that Australia felt it should be making at the mm -hmm. time. Uh, so what uh, film did that become? Uh, that became The Man from Hong <laughs> Kong, because the climax of the film, of course, has our hero flying a hang glider, yes. landing on top of a building, getting in and blowing the, the top of the building. Uh, Who's actually in the hang glider? Is that a stunt Well, well that is Grant Page, the, 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 the stunt master of Australia. I, okay. I, I discovered him and managed his career for the first five years. Uh, 
and, um, and he's going to have a book coming out called Man on Fire. I thought, this guy has got something because he's got a, pers a personal charisma. Right. I could put him in front of the camera uh, and not give him anything too challenging to do as an actor. And then you could see that the guy was doing his own stunts, and I think the public will really respond to that. He's very appealing. Yeah, you know, as, yeah, as he, a character, he is. Really. He is. And you haven't seen Death Cheaters, probably, but uh, he's quite appealing in that, particularly his conversations with his Basset Hound. Uh, anyway, that's another story. But uh, getting back to the Man from Hong Kong, that that film has achieved sort of legendary and or cult status, yeah. and it really is well known. Um, obviously, he worked with George Lassen. He has one of the great tragic careers in Hollywood on some level. Yes, yeah. How was, how was that experience? And well, he, he was very easy to work with. He, he had been crushed by what he admitted was his own decision. Yeah. Yeah. He was being offered for three movies, uh, uh, each of them you know, for much more money than the, the next Bond film he would have to wait uh, to do. Mm -hmm. um, and he decided, hey, you know, I don't want to do this. I, I, I'm a star now, uh, and I, I'm going to take these other offers. Uh, now, you know, the powers that be don't, you know, don't care for that kind of behavior, and so, right. somehow those offers evaporated, and none of those films uh, went, were made. Mm. Uh, and he soon found that, you know, he was just basically blacklisted, uh, which is why he ended up going to Asia uh, and doing three films or, uh, for, for uh, Raymond Chow, um, Queen's Ransom, Stoner, and The Man from Hong Kong. But he was very easy to work with, uh, and he, you know, when we set him on fire and burned his hand, uh, he was you know, remarkably good about it. And he did want to hit me, but he didn't actually, probably because his hand was burned, I don't know. Uh, but I was going to stand <laughs> there and down. be hit. You'll have to you have to look at Not Quite Hollywood to hear the story from various people's perspectives. Though an actor who was not present said that he knocked me down and broke my jaw. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's funny what the mists of time do to the memory. Um, yeah, that actor was in Sydney at the time we were shooting in Hong Kong. But anyway, George was uh, an easy guy to get along with, and uh, I socialized with him later back here when I moved to America. And uh, it, yeah. He had something. He was a perfect leading man, uh, you know, the, the strong and silent type, um, with yeah, with a degree of wit whenever he w was required to summon it. Well, you know, it's interesting. He was not a bad Bond. No, he at was all. He very was good perfectly Bond. functional yeah. Yeah. and uh, kind of underrated, I think. And then yeah. Yeah, his, you know, his ego or whatever. Yeah, he admitted he had a, a bit of an ego then, and I think he deliberately ate garlic before his kissing scenes with Diana Rigg and things like that. Mm. And that, you know, that doesn't, it doesn't help your reputation. Yes, uh, that's not real smart. No, no. Like well, you know, if you want to be around a long time, you know, there are only two words of advice, make friends. Uh, and certainly you don't, you don't do that kind of thing. But the movies you made in that early stage uh, tended to be uh, very action-oriented, a lot of uh, Asian type stunts and activity. Uh, was that sort of what was coming your way at that point and you became known Well, these for were that? all projects that I initiated myself. Okay. Uh, after that, I kind of became a journeyman for hire with occasional projects that I pioneered. Uh, but as I said, I've, I've, I've you know, never seen a greenlit project I didn't like. Um, but you know the stuntmen, uh, you know World of Kung Fu, Kung Fu Killers, Man from Hong Kong, The Love Epidemic, uh, Danger Freaks. Those are all things that I, I pioneered and uh, uh, Death Cheaters uh, and wrote or co-wrote. Um, and uh, but my philosophy was uh, that uh, in Australia. You know, nobody knew we had a film industry. Luckily, the government was putting in money matched by the uh, you know, distributors of uh, for the foreign-owned distributors, uh, and uh, and if, you know, my co-production was the very first co-production Australia had ever done with an Asian film company, and uh, it didn't lead to many more, which I had hoped it would, mm. because it was a natural pairing. Uh, yep. But. Uh, because Australia had no stars, because people didn't really know where it was, and maybe it was to the left of Austria or somewhere, you know, uh, and, and because they thought that we spoke this 
funny way. Um, these are disadvantages we had to overcome in the uh, in the mid '70s. So what do you do? You give you give them something that you believe travels well, and the action is the universal currency of the movie market. Sure. You know, a good punch up in Sydney will play very well in Moscow. It'll play very well along the Zambezi River. Um, it'll play well in America. Uh, so. You know, that's you know, I thought. Let's let's give them lots of action, and there's a market for that everywhere in the world. It may not pay very much, but uh, but there's a market. And I found, yeah, you know, with Man from Hong Kong, for instance, that it became the all-time box office champion of Pakistan for several years, hmm. for four or five years. My kind of movies were considered, you know. Uh, they weren't socially redeeming works of art of a European style. They weren't uh, art films. They, they were. were no. they, they were actually films that people wanted to go to see. Yeah, they 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 were good, honest meat and potatoes movies for people who wanted to be taken out of their lives for an hour or two of escapism, and yep. that that's really how the movie business started with the Nickelodeon. Uh, but. Um, but anyway, I, I, I you know, made a couple of little things in Australia. Uh, our hospitals don't burn down. But then I thought I would do my uh, somewhat misleading title, by the way. But it did win. It, it was a prize-winning short. It was an industrial safety film, a total dramatized documentary about uh, what happens when fire breaks out in the middle of a multi-story hospital, cutting it basically in two. Mm. We christened it the Towering Infirmary. Um, but, you know, uh, that was our private name for it. But it was commissioned by the Veteran Affairs Department of Australia because they were getting alarming numbers of fires in their hospitals, so they needed mm. to teach all their staff fire safety procedures. So we did this dramatized documentary in which nine people die uh, and show all the mistakes that can be made either in bad housekeeping that allows sure. fuel of some kind to 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 uh, you know accumulate and then ultimately be ignited guy throws a cigarette butt down a laundry chute yeah yeah and uh, you can see, imagine the rest um, that won quite a number of w short film and industrial film awards um, but that doesn't get you a picture in Hollywood uh, so I devised one called stunt rock that would utilize you know, Grant Page's many, many skills, yep. and uh, I don't know when this will be broadcast, but I'm starting midnight shows of stunt rock uh, as of uh, July the 31st, Friday night, at the new Beverly uh, Cinema in uh, Beverly Boulevard in L.A., uh, and if it takes off, it, maybe it'll show once a month on a Friday midnight show. The DVD of it is coming out in August, but uh, Stunt Rock is, uh, was my attempt, to, is my sort of professional love letter to stuntmen in general and, hmm. and uh, highlighting, because they're the unsung heroes yep. of, of movies since movies got going, you know, the, the stuntman would fall off the horse and the actor would get up and look heroic. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, their contribution to, you know, our business and the success of our business is incredible. So I thought, well, if I have stunts, and what are, the, what are people like? They like music, rock and roll. Okay, stunt and rock. Right, famous stuntman meets famous rock group. Much stunt and much rock takes place. The kids will tear up the seats. Piece of cake. And somehow I got uh, a company in Europe to finance it to be shot in uh, L.A., Okay. I think primarily because the executive in charge would preferred to winter in Beverly Hills than in Amsterdam. It's understandable. Um, yeah, I, I, I can relate to that. Um, and so I got you know 450,000 to make the movie and 150,000 to make the long playing record of the band. Mm. They were going to give me the Eagles. They were going to give me this band and that band. But in the end, it was uh, a phone call on you know Wednesday saying, find a band by Monday or we shut down the picture. Uh, and it hadn't been, you know, we were going to be supplied with the band they felt was the most promotable. But in the end, uh, go find a band. So I did. I found you know, a band in Van Nuys um, and uh, who'd been declared illegal by the fire marshal when they performed at the whiskey. Uh, and they were just what I needed because they fired propane from their fingertips and uh, they did magic tricks as you know, a sort of a Gandalf-type wizard fights the Prince of Darkness while, you know, uh, long-haired people thrash guitars and talk about virgin sacrifice. Um, it, 
yeah, how could it fail? Uh, but I think it was just a little bit ahead of the curve for people and is now beginning to be appreciated by those with a sense of humor. Um, so it's a plotless film, um, and, uh, but it, it's a 90-minute trailer, really, to, to show 100 stunts in 90 minutes uh, and a, a lot of music of, you know, uh, depending upon your taste um, as to how you like it. You know, lyrics like, the virgin wept, she cried, she screamed, she did not want to die. Um, yes, it was you know, an interesting experience shooting the, 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 uh, the concert scenes. But It sounds like you got a lot of stuff in there. Oh, yeah, well, it, it moves like an express train. So to those who say, but there wasn't really a story. Well, you know, he meets this girl, and he meet, when I actually put my poor wife in the film. Uh, she is, she's there playing Lois, the reporter. Um, and um, it, my investors said you have to have this Dutch star Monique van der Ven in the film okay. who was a Verhoeven regular Katja Tippel and pictures like that yes uh, and uh, Monique was great uh, and uh, and I recently showed the film in Holland at a film festival I was invited to to present it um, and the Dutch got a, a great kick out of seeing her because she's now like a 60 year old uh, yeah ex you know, European movie star who's now a director. And this was like in her, you know, she was 25 when she uh, did goodness. the movie. Yeah. But, um, uh, but Stunt Rock, let's say, did not, uh, did not launch me in Hollywood. But luckily, I, I, uh, Disney, I got to meet some Disney executives and wrote a little story called Time Warp. And they said, oh, we like this. And I, I got a one-year development deal to write the screenplay and to sit in on the filming of the black hole to see how things were done at Disney. So I worked, on, in, I worked for Disney for a year, um, but it, the black hole was not a success, and I'd written like another $20 million uh, sci-fi time travel picture. Uh, and uh, uh, so they said, you know, we bought the script, but we're not going to make it. Mm. Um, and uh, so, yeah, at that point, you know, Australian, the only Australian directors who were really, you know, doing well were the, the A-list directors who, you know, had nice European-style, high-quality, you know, artistically, mm -hmm. uh, film of art, films of artistic merit. Um, and, you know, I, you know, I could have gone and worked for Roger Corman, um, which might have been a good idea, uh, but I elected to, you know, keep trying to push my own projects. So after a couple of years of that, uh, Australian financiers said, well, there's a new tax scheme, come back here and, uh, and make some movies for us. And I basically did nine films in seven years. Wow. Uh, uh, and then again, I saw the writing on the wall that you know, the, the level of government involvement in, in the choice of which projects got funded had now you know, reached, you know, uh, well, uh, proportions that, you know, let, me, let me put it another way, the, uh, again, the, the high-minded nature of you know, government bureaucrats wanting to, you know, uh, let's say, clink glasses at cocktail parties and talk about you know, the socially redeeming films that they were greenlighting, right. that kind of, they didn't find my uh, you know, sort of generic, uh, internationally appealing uh, films right. that they thought the private sector should be funding those. Uh, so I thought, well, I will come back to Hollywood and uh, have my last hurrah, shall we see, and uh, see how long it lasts. And uh, so I came here in 1990, uh, leaving Australia as, a, let's say, a medium-sized fish in a small pond, and I arrived here and immediately became plankton. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and I, I, I like to think that I have, you know, I've worked hard to, to, and I believe I have now become a sardine. And uh, within, with any luck, I might end up as a sort of reasonably well thought of trout. Uh, but I will never be a big fish uh, because uh, I think I'm just a little too off center for, for some people. I mean, executives at the major studios do not want to hire their father. Uh, or particularly someone who probably knows a lot more about the trade than they do. Um, so I work in the independent field and uh, in the field where people think, oh my God, we've got to make this film in 15 days, uh, but it's got to look big, who do we get? 
and you know that's you know um, that's I've done a lot of that work. Let's you, say you in the last eight years, you are certainly one of the solutions to that question. <laughs> yes, and, and, and mm. can solve those problems. And but I, I see nothing wrong with that. You see, I don't consider that to be. A, you know, to be downgraded necessarily, or I, I don't feel that's a demeaning kind of filmmaking. I remember my mother. She was so beautiful in every way, too. She just. I can remember her pushing me on the swing in the backyard when I was small. <laughs> she was always so kind, you know, reading me stories and books. She called me little Marky. <laughs> Mark's my middle name. Do you have a picture of her? No. I wish I did. Well, Paul and I actually enjoy that world quite a bit, and I don't think that we would be effective in a you know a fifty hundred million dollar world. That's you know not a world that we understand. Or you can't exist. control it to the degree that you can control a low budget film. Uh, and yeah, I, I mean, what is a low budget film? It's relative, of course. Yes. To me, ten. I mean, I've directed a twenty million dollar film, uh, but I had a yeah pretty much. I had a fair degree of control over it, and uh, mm -hmm. until the final cut, when the producer added five more minutes that I'd cut out. Um, but, uh, but that was a, 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 a totally independently funded film, self-distributed. Sure. Uh, 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 but you know, those things are rare. Filmmaking is filmmaking, whether it, you, know, you go out with your camcorder and, uh, and do something, and, or your cell phone camera. Well, you're very determined, and, and, and you work with adversity very well. You don't let it mow you down or slow mm. you down, you just keep going. Um, one of the uh, early films you made for us was Britannic, mm -hmm. which came after Titanic and probably was made for less than the catering budget. That's what I said to James Cameron, Titanic. actually. He was uh, with Spielberg and Katzenberg, he was co-hosting a 3D symposium at the DGA. Mm -hmm. and. I found, yeah, uh, by you know, you know, careful maneuver, uh, myself walking behind him into the theater after the uh, little drink session beforehand. Sure. Um, and uh, I said, Mr. Cameron. And he turned and I uh, said, I made Britannic on your catering budget. And you know, he was not offended. Um, he just sort of looked at me for a moment and he said, oh, yeah, you know, that had some quite good CG in it. Well done. And then he walked on in. Uh, so he did see it. <laughs> Interesting. Um, well, I think it holds up really yeah. well. I mean, that film was made 10 years ago. Yeah. And uh, I watched it again the other night. I watched it many times because mm. it's uh, of the films we've made, it's one of my favorites. Mm. I, I think it's a good story. It's a good story. Yeah. Uh, it's actually, to my mind, a better story than Titanic on many levels. Yes, that was something I didn't say to Mr. Cameron. Um, but, no, no I, but, 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 but I think there was much more going on in the story, uh, certainly. And uh, you know, I found the, you know, the relationship you know, between the, you know, the spy, uh, well, the two spies, um, yep. I think after 10 years, it can be a bit of a spoiler, but uh, their relationship. I think it's okay. Yeah, I think it's okay now. Um, I, I think that it was a much more interesting uh, you know, relationship. And I, I made it as, uh, deliberately as a kind of a florid uh, melodrama, um, kind of eye of the needle on a doomed ship, yep. if to give it its sort of genre labeling. And I think you could re-release it uh, in the, whatever markets are available for reruns today. If we could just up, up you know, re-render the visual effects, which, by by and large, were pretty good. Certainly, very good for their day. I think ninety percent of them are quite good. Yeah. There, there's a few that you know. Yeah. That yeah. The technology has advanced. Yes. But yeah, that's uh, a fact. it, uh, particularly the scene where the torpedoes are heading towards the ship, mm. and the gun is being used to shoot them down. Mm is uh, incredibly authentic. Yeah. You, really, you really believe that all that's going on and everybody's Yeah, the, the blend of live action and uh, animation is pretty, pretty good. good. 
And you know that is a an actual 1912 Lewis gun mm. with the rotating drum of ammunition on top. All the shots that it fires, it gets cut into many in many parts. Mm. It's because after about you know, six or seven rounds, it would die on us. Brian, one of uh, my other favorite movies that you did for us was Tides of War, uh, Phantom Below, which was a dual purpose picture uh, mm. done in uh, effectively two versions. Um, first of all, I think it's a terrific film. Mm, I, good, just, glad you, you like know, it. In, enjoyable from beginning to end. Mm. It kind of moves the whole time through with very little slow spots and uh, nice performances. But um, you shot two versions, one of which has a little bit of uh, gay content mm -hmm. to it and one of which does not, which allows us to show it on the network as well as sell it uh, throughout the world. Yeah. as a traditional action thriller. Five bucks, there and back. Oh, you're on. Come on. You ready? Ready? Go. Oh, oh yes! So oh, no way! <laughs> you lost. <laughs> you lost. You lost. Oh, <laughs> I actually had to make three versions of the film. Okay. Um, there is the gay version, the straight version for international consumption with the exception of Japan, and then a straight version for Japan because naturally as far as Japanese broadcasters are concerned there are no homosexuals in Japan. Mm. Uh, but they, w they wanted the film uh, five minutes longer. That's right, I remember that now. And it would have helped to have discovered that during shooting, but I only found out about it during post-production. Um, so I, it, it, it suddenly... There's no reason to make this too easy. You, no, 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 no. I mean, there's no such put, things. Yeah, you know, it's all part of life's rich tapestry mm -hmm. indeed. Uh, so it, you know, I thought, how am I going to do this? Because I haven't dropped a single scene because I don't want that scene and I'm just going to make 90 minutes barely. Uh, right. So, but then I realized, of course, I have bought 56 stock shots uh, and the price is the same provided now none of those shots uh, exceed 10 seconds in length and several of them are two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. So why don't I add a little bit to the front and the end of some of those stock shots and basically, you know, uh, I can gain minutes that way. Also, I have nearly 150 visual effects shots, of which about 100 are either torpedoes or submarines in motion or you know, various things. Well, we might just add a half second here and a half second there. So I was able to you know, fatten it up for That's the Japanese. That's pretty clever uh, able to do that. Yeah, but as for uh, you know, making two versions, I mean, my only regret about the film is that I, I, and the same applies to In Her Line of Fire, my right. lesbian Rambo movie, I wanted to make it more gay, you know, but, uh, and, uh, but in the time constraints and the budget constraints of, uh, of, the, sh of the schedule, um, you couldn't afford to have too many alternative scenes. I mean, there are quite a lot in Tides of War compared to you yes. know, later productions. Um, there are about six different uh, areas of the film that had to be remixed and recut for uh, the straight version. The straight version in America, incidentally, I understand, shipped 150,000 units on uh, DVD yeah. through Sony. Uh, so it, it certainly played well for its intended and possibly Middle West audience. It was a rah-rah patriotic film, right. uh, which they would never have wanted to watch if they, you know, if the hero. Uh, was shown to be gay. I think that's uh, a gap in their lives and their thinking, but uh, that's why you're making dual purpose films. Right. Um, uh, but I would have loved to have uh, you know, uh, had more of the don't ask, don't tell issues uh, into the film, but it was economically prohibitive. Well, I, I, th I think you did a terrific job yeah. on it because the, um, the Tides of War version, which is the gay version yeah. of that picture, 
has uh, really a lot of emotional stuff going on, it, it and a lot of subtext. Yeah, it, it does have it. And I think you know, probably some of your audience has written in and said, you know, well, we, we like this film, and it, it, did, it does say something about the gays and the military issue. I mean, I, I believe at one of the premieres that you attended, uh, I attended one with you, but I think there, there was a, a, a gay and lesbian film festival in Hawaii where it was shown, again, in the straight version, which was the only version available at that time. Um, some, uh, a, an eight-year serviceman got up in the audience in the, uh, in the question and answer session and came out in front of the yes. audience, uh, and uh, which, you know, it may, may have caused him to be thrown out of the military. I don't know, but he felt strongly enough about the issue uh, to, to take that risk uh, and, and get up and praise the film from uh, the perspective of a gay man serving in the military. I mean, I didn't think, uh, well, I'm, I'm an old married man with two grown sons, and, you know, I nonetheless feel that no one should have their character or their social worth judged by how they rub their pink bits together, you know? I mean, that's, it, it's genetic programming. It's got nothing to do with moral choice. Right. You are either attracted to the opposite sex or the same sex, or, you know, in the case of some Greek people I know, goats. Um, but there, you know, this will never play. Different it. subject. Yes, 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 as they say, you know, for, uh, you know, anyway, I won't pursue that line of argument. But uh, the... It, your, your point is taken, but, and, um, you know, I really like the gay version of that movie hmm. because uh, the Adrian Paul character who plays the commander, um, you know, he has lost the uh, person he had a relationship mm. with early in the picture, and rather than it being a traditional, oh, my friend has been killed, he is grieving the loss of this, something he cannot share mm. in terms of the nature of the relationship. And then there's a complex, complex relationship between him and the sister of his mm. lover, mm. who, you know, resents him for, you know, supposedly causing uh, the death, and in addition knows of, uh, now about what was going on between mm. the two of them and is angry about that in her own way. Mm. And, and so she has to go through her own process of seeing the kind of person her brother was and the kind mm. of person the protagonist yeah. was. So there's a lot of stuff going on in that picture. Well, all of those issues make it better drama yeah. than... You know, it's a better the, story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have real conflict you know, and, and you know, internal conflict, and it makes the hero more heroic. Uh, I mean, w will the gay version be played on some European cable systems, for instance? Uh, how, to what extent has the gay version penetrated uh, the international market? It varies from country to country. And, of course, our network uh, plays online throughout the world. Mm. So uh -huh. this movie um, is one we can play again and again because it's really a first-rate quality movie. Mm. And it's, uh, I think, uh, one of the better movies we've made mm. for the network. Um, you know, you've made some other good ones mm. for us uh, yeah. as well for Lifetime and yeah. for some of, the, our, our, of our other buyers. But this kind of work that you did with uh, Tides of War and with uh, In Her Line of Fire, where you did... Um, a more commercial version and then a version for the network mm. is incredibly important to us because it really gives us you know quality movies to show on the network mm. and you know this is something we're uh, we're building from scratch with yeah. our own investment and it's uh, no. life uh, well it, 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 life threatening it, it, and death defying yes I have special permission from the vice president to get any coverage I need have had it for two months why do you continue to have such a problem with it I have a problem with you. When the vice president is on a phone call with the White House chief of staff, don't put a camera in his face. Got it? Got it. But uh, I find it interesting that you don't get on Kendall's or Murphy's ass. What is it about mine you find so attractive? The vice president finds you entertaining. To me, you're a hassle and a headache. It's his choice you're here. But your access to him is my choice. So, if you compromise my job again or question my authority, I'll make sure the only shots you get are through a telephoto lens.
country boy. Trying to keep up with your city slickers. All right. Yeah, let's see when we get back. That, gentlemen and ladies, was off the record. You and Paul have uh, taken a very bold step uh, with you know, starting the Here Network from scratch. Uh, and, and you've come a, you know, a real long way and you must have built up a, a really good library uh, of gay and lesbian films, either by acquisition or by production. Right. Um, and I just hope the next time I make a dual purpose film for you, um, I can find ways of giving the gay audience more gay content. Uh, that still fits into the budget of the film uh, and so that even with all the post-production changes that need to be made, um, then the, the gay audience gets something that's really gay uh, and the international audience hasn't a clue. Uh, or they, they, they're the straight audience hasn't a clue. But uh, So that'll be a, a future challenge for me. Well, and I, I think there'll be some movies that will we'll just do the gay version. You yeah. know, that, and that'll be the way it goes. And but there's something very subversive on some level of presenting um, a gay person in a heroic context yeah. and not really having the movie necessarily be about being gay. That's a byproduct of who they are, mm. uh, as if they were black or yeah. anything else. Well, gay people used to be allowed to be represented on the screen, except in uh, the roles that I think gay people referred to as the sissy. Right. Uh, the funny gay guy. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the shop assistant uh, who, who was a little flamboyant and, and, and timid and effeminate. These characters were allowed by mainstream cinema so that you know, they could be laughed at. Uh, yep. But there wouldn't be a direct reference to the, to the person's sexual preference. Um, now, gradually, in the 60s, uh, some brave people, a brave gay actor like uh, Dirk Bogart, uh, decided, no, I'm going to lend my name and uh, I've been a romantic you know, heterosexual lead in all these films uh, before, uh, I'm going to lend my name to a picture called Victim in mm. which uh, a yep. barrister is threatened with blackmail because uh, he is actually gay um, and it would be the, the ruin of him professionally if it got out. So uh, the film was not particularly successful but it was a very brave film and you know, I think as uh, it's still people still look at it together as an interesting social document of the time. Uh, so, you know, I I think the I, I'm proud of uh, of making Tides of War, particularly because I made it in the teeth of opposition from um, the military, who would not cooperate with us in any way, uh, and so I had to build the submarine interior. Um, uh, the control room and the radar and the sonar room uh, basically was a Home Depot submarine. Uh, and, uh, 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 but I couldn't afford to build you know, corridors and machinery, etc. And no naval ship would let us on board. And even the museum ships uh, that were in Honolulu Harbor, the, you can only access them across naval property and we were denied access. Yeah. So I had two big uh, challenges. Uh, how can I represent the rest of the ship? Um, and how can I do the funeral scene, which would be a military funeral? Yes. Luckily, there were some gay connections we had in uh, the uh, Navy Reserve. Uh, and there was a, uh, a, a, a Naval National Guard cemetery. Uh, uh, in Honolulu, or on the windward side of the island, mm -hmm. and we were able to get in there under the radar on the very first day, shoot those scenes before people found out about us and get out. And I think the funeral scene is, is, is a touching uh, scene. As the very first day we shot, and the very first shot I did was a tracking shot past foreground flowers, and Adrian Paul is walking uh, through the uh, through the graveyard to go and meet uh, his, his lover's, uh, his dead lover's sister. And just as we were setting up, a rainbow came up in the background yep. because it's, it, you know, you get liquid sunshine in, Hon in, in Honolulu quite a lot. Um, 
And I thought, oh God, we've got to get that, we've got to get that, because that's a little touch of symbolism that can go in there. Yes. Uh, and uh, luckily the rainbow held for us to get that shot. And so the film sort of started well. Uh, the, 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 the movie gods were smiling upon us, perhaps. It has a little bit of a spiritual yeah, uh, yeah, bent uh, yeah. to it. And, and there's a great scene where the two um, are, uh, Matt Pataglia and Adrian Paul, are standing overlooking the city mm. and talking. At Barry McQuana tomorrow in Washington. I spoke with his mother for about an hour today. She's devastated. Her whole world is turning upside down. These are hard times. And there's a whole lot of pain to go around. I saw that boat, Dizzy. I saw it as plain as I see you standing next to me. It's a phantom waiting out there, posing a danger to our entire fleet. And the Navy thinks I'm lying to cover up my mistakes. I believe you, Captain. And I've always been proud to serve by your side. You're my rock, Dizzy. Thank you for being my friend. You see a bit of a friendship between hmm. a gay man and a straight man, yeah. which is something that meant something to me because of my friendship with Paul, right. my business partner, who's yeah. gay, and uh, spearheads our network, and you know we've become the closest of friends. Mm. And that scene really, I think, captured very nicely the kind of rapport and the the, the fact you can depend on that person yeah. and their sexualities of no consequence. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, history is full of gay heroes. Uh, it really is. Yeah, they haven't been acknowledged. Uh, and you like history quite a bit, don't you? And, yeah, I, and I, I do, I do. Yeah, and uh, uh, I mean, some the greatest stories are all there in history. And I mean, some of the films that influenced me early in life were these big Hollywood epics and their cheaper Italian cousins. Uh, you yes. know, I would see Spartacus. Uh, with Kirk Douglas, and then a few months later, I'd go and see Steve Reeves in *Son of Spartacus*, uh, and uh, uh, you know Goliath against the vampires and things like that. Sure. Um, but spectacle has always uh, interested me, and history is spectacle. I mean, these are these are great human dramas played out on an enormous canvas. They're hard to make in the budgets that you and I work in, but yeah. there are ways, and this is something we should work at to try yes. to do together, because we would really enjoy it. My I revisionist think, Richard to... III. Well, it's uh, it, a really good story and a really yeah. good script, and one that uh, hopefully eventually yeah. no, be able to be put together. Yeah, it would be together. great. I mean, now, your, uh, your beautiful wife, Margaret, is a historian. Yes. Can you talk about her a little bit? She's one of my favorite people. And oh, I... thank you. She, she will be pleased to hear that, and she does send her fond regards to you. Uh, and uh, thanks you very much for attending her lecture at the, uh, the Huffington Ecumenical Institute. It was fun. Um, well, I mean, I was uh, touring the United States with Grant Page doing stunt shows in, in rural areas or, or let's say non-big city areas uh, of America to promote The Man from Hong Kong. Okay. And we'd done a show in Jacksonville, Florida. We then flew to El Paso, Texas and uh, did a sh short stunt show at the airport when we arrived um, for the media that had been yeah, pre-arranged. Then we were to do another show at um, the University of, Te uh, of Texas, El Paso. Um, because the film was opening the next day in both El Paso and Juarez. Um, so in between the fire stunt uh, and the bike stunt, uh, where I had to knock Grant off a bike with a rubber baseball bat, um, and I just set him on fire and then put him out, um, you know, the huge student body uh, had gathered to watch this uh, close to lunchtime. But my wife, being a, 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 a dutiful student, had decided she would uh, you know, stay in her French class. But luckily, it finished 15 minutes early, so she came out to watch. And then, as I was working the crowd to promote the movie, uh, a, a voice shouted, hey, you want to meet an actress? 
and, uh, and I looked at the voice and standing next to the voice was this beautiful blonde girl who was going very red in the face and looking at the pavement, uh, acutely embarrassed and because she had no idea this friend of hers was going to do that. Sure. So I walked over and uh, uh, was introduced and uh, they said, um, so you got any advice as a movie director for a young girl starting out in the acting business? Because she'd won Best Actress Award two years running at, uh, at the university. And uh, I looked at this poor embarrassed girl and I said, well, well, I heard myself say, that the words came from somewhere deep within me, I suppose. I said, whatever you do, don't lose your soul. And that was the right thing to say to this particular girl who mm. is full of soul right. and is, is uh, to uh, he's one is the goodest person I know in the area of you know the sheer quantity of of, of goodness. Uh, she certainly has been uh, given uh, a royal share, and uh, has uh, has improved me enormously over the years. Um, so uh, I said, don't go away. I've got to do this stunt, and then there's the press lunch. Please come to the press lunch. Um, and I ignored the press and spoke only to her, got bad reviews. Um, and then we went to a TV station where I was to be set on fire. It kind of frightened the afternoon talk show host. He wasn't really expecting that. Uh, and, but she wasn't particularly impressed. I guess the guy knows what he's doing, you know. Um, and then we went to the Juarez dog track um, that evening. Uh, we were chauffeur driven everywhere. Uh, 20th Century Fox was paying. And, um, um, we started to talk seriously, uh, you know, about children, about religion, about our respective values in life. Um, then I, I, I you know, dropped her home and um, the next day we met again uh, after my friend had jumped off the 17-story building, uh, slid down a rope, of course. Uh, another day at the office. Another day at the office, exactly. It's probably the same at the Hair Channel, you know. Uh, people are sort of... Uh, we throw people off. Throw, throw them off. The 17th indeed. floor. Well, it, it, homophobes are thrown regularly off the roof, I'm quite sure. Well, we just, um, we just choose random. Ah, oh, oh, good, in, you know, good. Well, that's a lot. So you keep perhaps. your employees. Loose. I, I can tell. I can tell. Uh, so, uh, yeah. The next day after that, uh, we went to, to the mountains for a picnic, and I proposed. And uh, you know, so we were basically married 16 days after I after we met. Uh, nine of which I was away. Um, My goodness. And uh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I always knew that she was extremely bright. And after you know, some years as a, an actress of varying you know, success and, and lack of real recognition, um, uh, she decided to go back to, well, to finish the degree that I interrupted, because mm -hmm. uh, I scooped her up and took her off to Australia, having married her. Um, her parents wondered whether, you know, however charming I might be in person, was I really a trunk murderer and would be mailing her parts to a dead letterbox <laughs> in Alaska or something. Uh, you know, they would always have these thoughts after I left the room. Um, right. but, um, it's nice to know they had that kind of confidence yes, in you. Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, and um, anyway, off we went back to Australia where I had to do Danger Freaks, which was uh, ready for production. Um, and, uh, you know, but. You know, when we came to America in 1990, she said, look, I'm tired of waiting for people in a small dark room to decide whether I can practice my craft. Uh, sure. And she, she had you know, spent a lot of time doing charity work when she wasn't working. She ran, well, she, she was a bereavement counselor for an AIDS foundation in Australia mm. where she counseled the parents uh, of the guy who's going to die. Uh, and she helped counsel those who were going to die, um, and it, it, it's a very draining uh, uh, work. But yes. because of her essential goodness and uh, an empathy towards her fellow human, um, she she did this work. Uh, and uh, uh, but yeah, finally when we got here, she thought, no, let's I'll get my arts degree finished. And I'll get another degree in a subject that I'm interested in. And she naturally gravitated towards history and eventually um, you know, got her PhD. She's a Byzantinist by specialty, um, though she teaches Western Civ, Western Civ and uh, you know, global encounters. And 
She's you know, got another a couple of other courses that she's prepared and is currently you know, uh, lecturing at uh, Loyola Marymount University. Um, so her um, focus area is Byzantium it and is. history. But I mean, she's pretty well rounded up to uh, you know up to the 15th century, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, in European history and in global encounters. Because after all, history was taking place in parts of the world that wasn't white. Uh, yes. Mayan history, uh, you know, African history, Asian history. Um, trouble with the teaching of history has been in the past, it's been too Eurocentric um, and because the dominant colonial powers you know, saw to it that it was. Right. Um, but you know, there were great empires rising and falling and uh, uh, you know, great strides being made in, in, in civilization and in, in other cultures. Uh, and history will be, you know, I think probably more equitably taught gradually uh, from now on. People don't realize that that empire existed hmm. you know, for a thousand years, 800 yeah. years. Yeah, they think the fall of the Roman Empire in 410, um, or I suppose really 450 something, yeah. uh, it w that was it. But no, the Eastern Roman Empire, which, you know, it was Roman, they just did it in Greek. Yes. Um, but it was Roman culturally speaking. That's how they thought of themselves, yeah. even even though yeah. they were in the East. And That's right. A little different religion uh, or yeah. a, a different variation of the same uh, yeah. Catholicism. Yeah. And fascinating, really. Yeah. So I, I, I need to find some Greek millionaires who can back, you know, a, a, something that will, uh, you know, depict the glory that was uh, Eastern Rome. It would be interesting, and it would have to be very well written, to do something along the lines of I, Claudius, mm. dealing with the Byzantium Empire, yeah. because their intrigue oh, and yeah. the, some of the, the tragedy and brutality, as well as mm. the romance, well, uh, I, is I, quite amazing. I did try. I mean, uh, for a brief period, I had rights to uh, Robert Graves' book, Count Belisarius, which takes place in the reign of the Emperor Justinian mm. and his extraordinary wife, Theodora, who was a high-class courtesan, right. um, and uh, I'm familiar it became, with the yeah, yeah, and uh, um, that you know that's a monumental book, of course, and I could not. I, I was trying to get it going as a miniseries, but I, you know, I, I couldn't. I, I wasn't big enough to to be influential enough. Well, I, I haven't read that book, so I'm going to make sure I do because I love those sorts of things. And yeah. he, of course, is magnificent, and what a, what a you know. Great historian and novelist. Yeah, really. Yeah, he, he takes a lot of it from the from Procopius's Secret History, which was published you know, after Procopius's death, which you know, would have taken place rather sooner if anyone read it, um, because the things he says about the Emperor Justinian and Theodora uh, would certainly have resulted in an off with his head. Uh, yes. But uh, um, but no, you'll you will enjoy the book, great. and it's extraordinary. That here, here was you know, Justinian's favorite general, uh, you know, Belisarius, um, who was a Thracian, in fact, um, virtually reconquered the entire Western Roman Empire uh, with 15,000 men. He took all of North Africa back. He worked his way right up to Rome, but then because he was not properly supplied and due to jealousy and all sorts of other factors, yeah. Uh, had to, you know, let Rome go and uh, gradually retreat. But it's a, it's an amazing story, uh, and uh, there are many amazing stories to be had throughout uh, the the history uh, of the Eastern Roman Empire. Yes. Now, uh, um, as you you're, you're moving on to another project, leaving this week, going to Tasmania. Yes. Um, and you'll be shooting a movie there for a month or two. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it's all I can say about it is that it is a a natural disaster movie with you know, strong environmental themes, um, uh, dealing with a rip in the ozone layer, and it will star Michael Shanks of Stargate SG-1 mm -hmm. sure. or SGI. I mean, I frankly, have not seen a Stargate episode for many years. Sure. But he has something like 10 years of longevity on Stargate. Uh, and uh, is very popular with science fiction fans. So this is a serious science fiction film. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Have you traveled much throughout Oceania through uh, 
make, through Polynesia and all those areas down there, or have you stayed pretty much in No, Tahiti. Australia? Uh, I mean, I've, I've never really explored uh, Fiji, um, it, uh, but Tahiti, I've spent time there. Uh, I shot some of Danger Freaks there, and, uh, and uh, you know, had a little holiday yeah. there with Margaret, and we fed deer by hand. It's a wonderful, you know, you know, you know, wonderful experience. Um, but uh, no, I, I mean, I've done, I've made films in the Philippines, uh, yep. and uh, I've been to India and Thailand. Okay. But uh, um, I'd love to spend more time in, in Polynesia. They're interesting islands, mm. and you you forget how different people live their lives, and mm. you know, they hear about the things that are going on in the rest of the world, but they're they're a long ways away <laughs> yes. from it all. What sort of thoughts or counsel would you give uh, a young person who wants to do some of the, the things you've done and uh, in your life and, and work in some of the areas you've worked in? What, what would you say to them? Firstly, really study your subject and not necessarily at a film school. Uh, I think a lot of what is taught at film school uh, is airy-fairy nonsense and theory. Um, uh, so the sooner you can actually get working on a film set and get to see the industrial process right. to manufacture the product, uh, uh, you know, then I, you, know, you, you learn you know, enormous amounts more than you would at film school. Mm -hmm. Now film school gives people an opportunity to, to you know, make their own films and express, you know, f find their film personality, I suppose. I mean, in a way, our first film is a signpost to really where our instincts lie. And I mm -hmm. suppose the man from Hong Kong, as a as a sort of prolonged, you know, action fight chase, you know, movie full of laughs and gasps and a, a sly dig at its own genre, uh, is pretty indicative of a mind uh, of, of my filmmaking personality. And I can apply that to. You know, leprechaun in space, uh, or you know, any genre known to man. Um, yeah, but you know, it, it, but you know, it, film schools I think maybe have their purpose, but I think they should uh, not get into arcane theory and be more about what is practical and what is good storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, that's you know, uh, being being a, a, a good director is someone who can understand the the issues in the script and solve any con, any problems that the script has uh, either with the writer or by himself and then uh, the, the second key to success is having good casting um, and uh, if you cast the right actors and you've constructed the story well so that the audience is never ahead of the of the story which quite often we find that is the case they're waiting for the the cast to catch up with where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you can avoid that, that is, you know, that 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 will certainly make the film more compelling viewing. But all of this is best learned by practicing, by doing, uh, by doing it. And you know, you, you should be patient and relentless in, you know, just you know, you're bashing your head against a brick wall, but just yes. keep on bashing. Um, I'm going to bash my head against the wall for my revisionist Richard III to the end of my days, uh, because that's a film I believe is is worth making. And uh, um, if I can correct a a, a a false history, that would be great. But the main thing is to keep at it and never say die, and and maybe adopt a little bit of my philosophy and never sort of uh, well always respond to a greenlit project. You know, uh, it gives you an opportunity to practice your craft, uh, and so you know, the more you practice, the better you get, and because right. you'll always learn something. And I'm going to learn something. You know, I, I, I'm sure I learned something last year from doing Porky's and from doing that webisode pilot fusion, um, and I'm sure I will learn from the film I'm about to make, and yes. perhaps, and hopefully, the 20 more I have uh, still, you know get to uh, to make before you know, I keel over beside the camera after the last shot is done and it's you know, it's all edited in the camera anyway so all the, you know, the Hitchcock actually would uh, 
control the editing of his films sometimes by saying that this shot is only going to play up to that line of dialogue and then we're going to go to something close-ups uh, and then we're going to come back on this shot uh, afterwards as they get up and leave the room. So he put his hand in front of the lens for the part that he did not want the producer to have access to. This is when he was dealing with Irving, uh, with, with uh, uh, Selznick. Selznick, yeah. So, Selznick. Um, and uh, uh, so I don't go that far, but I, uh, uh, but you know, because I've generally been allowed a modicum of control in the editing room because editing is my background. Right. And, I, I, and you're very good at fixing pictures. You've done that for us and for yeah. others. No, I, I enjoy being a film doctor uh, because uh, you know you, you can you can see where where you can you know pump some more juice into the picture. Uh, relatively cheaply and reorganize it so it's it's got more narrative drive or whatever uh, so that that's fun I mean, the main thing is to keep working and if you're not actually being paid to work go out with your camcorder and make films with your friends uh, and see how they work and yeah. just keep on going I mean to survive in this business it requires you know uh, a lot of determination the business is getting harder and harder uh, as the years go by, as as the, the the corporate well the major communications corporations continue to amalgamate, and there be, there are fewer places to go, uh, and you know it's just you know, it's musical chairs, and more and more chairs keep disappearing as each time the music yes. stops. So you just have to be all the more determined. Yep. But once you're in. Uh, and you've shown that you deliver the goods, then you, your fame will spread. And on a certain niche level, at least, you'll start working. And then maybe you can upgrade yourself to, to a, a better funded niche after that. So a lot of people are now going to be making webisodes and proving themselves through those relatively inexpensive productions. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, then maybe getting an episode of network television as a result. Right. Uh, but um, uh, you know, it's you just got to really study the landscape and duck and weave and keep moving forward. Thank you, Brian, so much for spending this time. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for asking. You're welcome. And thank you, here viewers. Keep watching the channel. Keep watching Tides of War. <laughs> Great. Someone should write their thesis on it, actually.